Boldwood Presents A Mother's Shame Written by Rosie Clark and read by Annie Aldington The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Prologue The moon shone full on the water, mysterious and compelling, drawing me to the side of the bridge. I peered over the edge at the golden pool that seemed to mesmerise me, cutting through the apathy and the mutites of grief clogging my mind. By day the river appeared brown, sluggish, polluted by oil from the ships in the docks, and by the debris that swirled relentlessly in little circles. On and on, always present, like the ache that gnawed at my heart. Tonight there was a golden glow, warm and deep, tugging at my senses. I felt that if I could fall into the reflected moonlight, I would be able to let go of all the memories. There would be no pain, no feelings of regret. I could drift down into that shining pool, and my body would dissolve, become part of the light I found so inviting. It would be the best way to end it, this life that had no meaning, no joy. If I could cry, the agony inside me might ease, but my tears had long since dried. Now there was only emptiness and the nagging ache that would not let me rest. I should end it instantly, fall into the moonlight and let the water take me. I could almost feel myself drifting in a warm haze, dissolving and becoming a part of the light. I moved forward, intent on climbing the wrought iron structure of the railings so that I could take that final jump into oblivion. Now that's a foolish notion, lass. What do you want to do something like that for? I became aware of the man standing at my side. He wore the uniform of the Sally Army, and he was trying to be kind, but he did not understand. Panic swept over me. He would stop me reaching that golden glow, force me to return to a world where the pain was too hard to bear. I tried frantically to scramble up the iron structure so that I could leap into the reflected moonlight, but his strong hands held me back. I screamed at him, desperate to escape, but he hung on despite my struggles. Leave me alone. It's the best thing. I want to be with them. Nay, lass, you don't know what you're saying. Whatever is wrong, it can't be that bad. You're too young to die in that filthy river. Do you want to be eaten by rats? His words broke through the mists in my head. I stared at him, half dazed, hardly understanding. I wanted to drown in the moonlight, become part of the light. Drowning isn't like going to sleep. You'll be swept down river by the tide and caught in the reeds. As your body decays, the rats will come and tear at your flesh. When they fish you out of the water, your face will be half gone, your eyes just empty sockets. Stop! How could he know that I'd always feared rats? Suddenly I was sobbing, heavy, dry sobs that racked my body but gave me no relief. You don't know. You don't know what I've done. I deserve to die. I grabbed at him wildly, tugging at his coat as if somehow it was his fault for saving me. I should be dead. Nay, lass, I doubt you deserve to die in the river. He smiled at me, a gentle, sweet smile that wrenched at my heart because it reminded me of another person's smile. Why don't I take you to the cafe for a cup of tea and a bun? You can tell me all about it if you like. Tell you. My mind reeled as I tried to remember, the pictures misshapen and changing like the pieces in a kaleidoscope I had once won at a church fete. I wouldn't know where to begin. Why not start at the beginning? His fingers gripped my arm firmly. I felt the pressure of his hand guiding me away from the river. I wanted to break free and run back to the moonlight. I did not want to tell my story. I wanted to let go, forget. I wanted the forgiveness of death. But already I was remembering. The pictures were crowding in on me, settling in my mind, making me remember the things I tried so hard to forget. I suppose, I said, and the words were forced from me. I could not stop them tumbling out now that I'd begun. I suppose it began that November night in 1925, when I was still young but not innocent. I doubt that I was ever truly that. Chapter 1 
Bugger off, my mother's shrill voice cried. I've had enough. Do you hear me? I'm sick of you coming home stinking of the drink and... Her words were halted abruptly by the sounds of furniture crashing and one piercing scream. Standing at the top of the stairs, I listened to the wild sobbing that followed. There was nothing I could do. I knew what had happened below. In the morning, Ma's face and arms would be covered in bruises. Why did she put up with it? He was a bully and a drunkard, and she should send him packing. She should have done it long ago. If a man treated me that way, I would leave him. Better still, I would kill him. Pa was leaving the kitchen. The sound of his heavy tread sent trickles of ice down my spine, and I scuttled back to the bedroom. If he were only half drunk, he would use his fists on me, but if he were maudlin, he would put his arms about me. The last time he'd caught me unawares, he had pawed at my breasts and tried to kiss and fondle me. Quickly locking the bedroom door, I stood with my back to it, sickness rising in my throat as he rattled the door handle. Maggie, Maggie darling, let your pa in for a minute. I held my breath, praying he would go away, but he continued to bang at the door. Hearing a whimper from the bed, I realised his noise had woken my brother. Hush, love. I put a finger to my lips. If Pa heard us talking, he would keep tugging at the door handle. Robin pulled back the bed covers, and I crept in beside my little brother. He'll go away in a minute. Is he drunk again, Maggie? Don't let him come in, please. He won't. Robin's hair smelled clean and fresh. I'd washed him myself before putting him to bed. Ma no longer bothered about things like that. She was too worn down by worry and grief. I was determined that Robin should not be neglected. He was never quite well, and at nearly eight years old, too thin and slight for his age, always coughing. I shan't let him hurt you. Damn you, Maggie. Open this door, you slut. Pa rattled the handle. You wait till I get hold of you. The door shuddered as he put his shoulder to it, but the lock was stout and it held. After a few moments, we heard his heavy footsteps moving on down the landing. I hate him, Robin wept as I held him to me. I hate him. So do I. Don't cry, Robin. Go back to sleep, love. He will sleep it off and you'll be at school before he comes down in the morning. Why don't Ma send him away? I wish he would, but I'm not sure he would go. He knows where his bread's buttered. He would be on the streets if she turned him out. I wish he would die. I held Robin's thin body against me, kissing the top of his head. Go to sleep, love. You've got a spelling test at school tomorrow, and I mustn't be late for work or I'll get the push. It was nearly six o'clock when I was allowed to leave my job at the bakery the following evening, when Mr Shirley finally got the lock on the door. He asked me to wash the shelves ready for the next morning. I know it isn't strictly your job, he said, but the woman who cleans is going to be late in the morning and those shelves need a wash. It didn't matter how hard you tried to keep things clean, the dust and dirt blew in off the streets of London and people would leave the door open as they gossiped on their way in or out. It was already dark when I emerged into the chill of a late autumn evening that dark November day. Shivering, I walked through the narrow, grimy lanes of the London Docklands. In the Queen Victoria Public House, I heard someone playing what I knew was jazz on the piano. Sung with a broad Cockney accent, it sounded like fun. Maggie? Maggie Bailey? Wait up a minute. The young man who had called to me lived just two streets away from the terraced house where I'd been born sixteen years before. Duncan was nineteen and worked on the docks like Pa and most of the men round here. I can't stop. They kept me late tonight and Ma will be waiting. I'm going your way. I've got to meet someone to talk about a job. He was tall and lanky, dark-haired with a gentle smile and soft eyes. His trousers were really wide in the fashion that people called Oxford bags, which had come in a couple of years previously. They looked odd on him, but as he was wearing them for work, he had probably bought them second-hand, like most of us did in the lanes. It was 1925, and the country was still recovering from the terrible war that had killed thousands of men. I thought you worked on the docks. That was only temporary. I'm going to train as a ship's carpenter. You're going to be a sailor? I want to build ships, Maggie. It is what I've always wanted, but there's no work round here and it means going away for a few years. But that is better than staying here and standing in line on the docks every day. Where are you going? Tilbury? 
they had no vacancies. I've got to go right away, to a place on the east coast called Yarmouth. It's a private boat builder, and I'll be working on mostly fishing boats until I've got my papers. But one day I'll have my own boat yard. His voice rang with pride, and that made me smile. If you want it enough, Duncan, I am sure you will. I shall miss seeing you around, though. I'll miss talking to you, Maggie. But this is what I have to do if I'm going to get somewhere in life. You must be clever, too, or you wouldn't think of doing something like that. Oh, I'm not clever, but I'm good with my hands. We'd reached my house. I stopped, lingering for a moment. I've got to go. Ma will be waiting for me. He nodded, looking hesitant, as if there was something more he wanted to say. But the words didn't come. I ran the last few steps to our house. The outside of it looked grimy, as did all the other houses in the lane. But at least the lace curtains were clean. Ma was always saying as how she wanted some new ones, but there was never enough money for extras, and there never would be, while Michael Bailey drank most of his money away. My mother came out into the parlour as I took off my coat, hanging it on an old-fashioned stand just inside the door. There were no halls in these back-to-back -back houses, just a front parlour, a kitchen and a scullery, with three bedrooms over and an outside toilet. Where have you been until this time? If you've been talking to boys, I'll have your hide, my girl. You're too young for courting. I've told you before, I won't have it. Do you hear me? I did talk to Duncan Coulson as we walked here, but I didn't stop to gossip or mess around, Ma. I was kept late at the shop. They've no right to keep you over your time. I hope there will be extra money in your wage packet tomorrow. Her face was badly bruised. Her body stooped, as if she was so much older than her years. I shouldn't think so. What's for tea, Ma? I'm hungry. Did you bring some bread home? Yes, and there's a stale bun for Robin that you can toast for his supper if you like. Where is he? Out in the yard. He can have the bun for his breakfast. As for you, you can have the same as your brother. A bit of toast and dripping. Oh, Ma, isn't there anything else? I've got a scrap of bacon, but that's for your pa's supper. When he gets here. Ma looked at the clock on the kitchen mantel. I thought he would be back by now. It's Friday and he gets paid for the week. He promised he would come straight home with the money tonight. I owe for last week's rent. You'll have my wages tomorrow, Ma. What have you had to eat today? She shook her head impatiently. You've got to eat, Ma. I've got a shilling safe towards my new coat. If I fetch some eggs from the corner shop, will you have something for yourself? I'm not hungry. I'll have a bit of toast if you'll make it, and some dripping, same as you. Keep your money, Maggie, or you will never save enough for that coat. The coat doesn't matter if you'll eat something. I told you, I want toast and a cup of tea. Make the toast now, because there's a basket full of ironing to do later, and you can do your share. I turned away to slice the bread, feeling the sense of injustice building inside me. Thoughts of Duncan Coulson flashed into my mind. Now there was a lad going places. If my father had a bit more gumption, he might do something of the sort. But all he did every day was to go down the docks and wait for someone to give him a job that paid a few pennies. Damn Pa and his drinking. It wasn't fair on the rest of us. My elder sister, Sadie, had left home the second she could, and sometimes I wished I could too. But Robin and Ma wouldn't manage without me. Hot water stung my hands as I washed plates and mugs. The flat iron was heating on the range. I took Robin's shirt out of the basket. By the time I'd pressed his trousers, two blouses for Ma, a dress and my skirt, I'd had enough. You haven't finished, Ma said as I turned to leave the kitchen. I'm not doing Pa's things. Besides, I've had enough. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. All right, have it your own way. I was too tired to do it all, but I'll press a shirt for him. You know what he's like if he wants a clean shirt? You can finish the rest tomorrow. And don't say you won't because you will. You're my daughter and you'll do as I tell you for as long as you live here. I woke when Ma screamed, jumped out of bed and went to the top of the stairs listening to the row between them. Pa was drunk again, and he had just hit my mother. His drunken rages were happening more often of late. Ma should stand up for herself more, but she just seemed to take it. Hearing another terrible scream from my mother, I ran down the stairs and threw the parlour into the kitchen. Stop it, Pa! You'll kill her before you're done! Pa's head came round to face me. His eyes looked strange, wild. Who asked your opinion? His words were slurred into one another. Interfering, little bitch. I'll teach you to keep your nose out of my business. No, Michael, 
Leave her alone. She doesn't know what she's saying. It's about time I taught her some manners. He lurched towards me, intent on striking out with his fists. Come here, you bitch. I backed away. He was going to beat me the way he beat Ma. I wasn't going to stand there and take it the way Ma did. I needed a weapon, something to defend myself with from his hammer fists. I was near the black cooking range, where a pan of water was simmering. Ma had it ready for my father to wash when he came in from the docks. Without thinking of the consequences, I picked up the pan of simmering water and threw the contents over Pa as he advanced on me. He screamed in shock as the hot water went over him, onto his face, through his clothes, scalding his skin. What have you done? You wicked, wicked girl! Stunned and scared, I watched Pa stumbling about the room, hands to his face, moaning and cursing. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't think. Away and get your sister Sadie. I'll need her to help me. I retreated towards the door as Pa crashed about the kitchen, still screaming and cursing. Turning from the scene of pain and chaos, I ran down the lane to Sadie's house, which was at the far end of the grimy street. The smell of thick smoke issuing from the chimneys of the other houses stung my throat. I could hear a foghorn out on the Thames, but all I could see in my head was the shock on Pa's face. I hammered at Sadie's door, and her husband Ben opened it. What's up, lass? Come away in, you're shaking like a leaf. It's Pa, he's hurt bad. Ma needs Sadie to help her. What happened to him? Sadie came to the door. Four months pregnant with her first child, she placed her hand affectionately on the bump. He was drinking again tonight, wasn't he? He, he scalded himself with a pan of hot water. My gaze dropped as I lied. Sadie made a shushing noise between her teeth. I knew he would do something daft one of these days. She looked at her husband. I suppose I'd better go if Ma needs me. Do you want me to fetch the doctor, Sadie, lass? Ben Masters was a North Country man who had traded the mines of Newcastle for the docks of London after serving his time in the army during the war. There's no money for doctors. Pa hasn't been right since he came home from the trenches. He thought he was entitled to hero's welcome after what he'd been through out there, and all he got was to stand in line with a hundred others begging for work on the docks. It hurt his pride, and that's why he went on the drink. He's a fool. We all have to stand in line for work down the docks these days, and his attitude doesn't help. Sadie looked tired and distressed as she listened to her husband. Want me to come with you, love? We'll be all right, Maggie and me. Sadie fetched her shawl. I'd come out without one and shivered as we walked back together, feeling frightened and guilty. If anything happened to Pa, they would likely throw me in prison for a long time. I was silent all the way home, holding back as my sister went inside the house. From upstairs, I could hear the sound of Robin crying. I'll go up to him. You help, Mum. I ran up the stairs, feeling glad that I could be of some use without facing my father again. He'd never seemed to like me much, and now he would hate me. I wished I could go back to before I'd flung that water over him. I should have found something else to defend myself with, something that wasn't so terrible as a pan of hot water. What's the matter with Pa? Robin asked as I went into the bedroom. He's been swearing something awful. He's got some hot water over him, I said. I put my arms about him. He's in pain right now, but he will be better soon. Try to go back to sleep, Robin. You can't do anything to help him. I'm hungry. I've only had a bit of bread and scrape for me tea tonight. That's because Ma had no money. She was relying on Pa to bring his wages home. If there's any money left, I'll go down the market and buy some food tomorrow, love. Robin whimpered a bit and then settled down, his eyes closing as he drifted into sleep. The noise from the kitchen had lessened considerably, though now and then I heard Pa yell out. I sat on the side of the bed, waiting and listening as Robin slept. Someone else had come into the house now. That was my brother-in-law's voice, and another man. Ben must have fetched the doctor, even though Sadie had told him there was no money to pay for his visit. I was afraid to go down and find out what was happening, it was not until an hour later that I heard the voices get louder and then the door shutting with a bang. Sadie, Ben and the doctor had all gone. Then the sound of slow footsteps coming up the stairs made my heart thunder in my chest. Ma entered, a lighted candle in her hand. I'm sorry. I just wanted to stop him hitting you, Ma. When he turned on me, I lost my head. Your trouble is that you don't think, Maggie. What you did was cruel. 
Scolding is one of the worst things that can happen to anyone. I'm sorry. How is he? He isn't dead, is he? The doctor gave him something to knock him out until the pain eases, Ma said on a sigh. He's given me a balm to treat the worst of the burns. Fortunately, the water wasn't as hot as it might have been, but it was bad enough. We've left him on the sofa for tonight. If he's better in the morning, Benny's going to help me get him up to bed. He was in a lot of pain, Maggie. Yes, I know. I wish I hadn't done it. God knows how we'll manage now. It was bad enough when your father gave me a few coins occasionally, but now he can't work. You will have to find work, Maggie. But I already work in the bakery, Ma. You'll have to do an evening job as well. Don't look at me like that, girl. You brought this on yourself. I need more money coming in, and you're the only one fit to work in this family now. Yes, I know. I'll do what I can. But there's only one sort of evening job I'm likely to get, and that's behind a bar. You've always been against me taking that kind of work. That was then. This is now. And things have to change. I'll look round on Saturday afternoon and see what I can find. Ma sighed. Don't blame yourself too much, Maggie. I've often wanted to hit back myself. But your pa was never like this until the war. They call it the Great War. But I think it was a wicked war. It's more than six years now since he came home at the end of it. And he can't let go. He drinks to forget the things he saw. And we have to remember that girl. Yes, Ma. I really am sorry. Sorry isn't much good to him, is it? Chapter Two I spent the whole of my free afternoon traipsing round the various alleys and lanes in the area, close to what had once been called St Catherine's Docks, but was now just a part of the London Docks. Once upon a time, there'd been a hospital here, and more than a thousand homes which were torn down to build the docks. Houses, pubs and various shops had sprung up in the area from here to the tower, and it was close by that I finally found what I was searching for. I tried several pubs, asking for work behind the bar in the evening, but now I was standing in front of a small cafe on the waterfront. When I went inside to the steamy warmth, the tables were almost all occupied, sailors and dockers, working men with grimy faces and hands. A couple of young sailors whistled at me as I went up to the serving counter. My cheeks were warm but I was used to being called after in the streets where I lived, perhaps because I had thick fair hair that waved onto my shoulders and greenish blue eyes. Evening, love, the man behind the counter grinned. He was a large man with a huge belly and receding hair. Come for a cuppa, have you? I certainly wouldn't mind one. It's cold enough outside, but I really came in to see if you had an evening job going spare. Grab her, Billy Biggins. One of the men sitting close by yelled out, Your trade will shoot up if she starts working here. I'll be in every night for a start. In that case, I ought to say no, Billy said, and winked at me. What makes you ask for an evening job, lass? My pa had an accident. He can't work for a while. I do a day job at a bakery, but Ma can't manage on what I give her. That's a bit rough on you, lass. He poured a cup of tea, pushing the sugar bowl towards me, and shaking his head as I reached for my purse. Keep your money. What's your name, lass? And how old are you? I'll be seventeen in a few weeks' time, and my name is Maggie Bailey. You be Michael Bailey's lass, then. What happened to your pa, Maggie? He was going for me ma, and I flung a pan of hot water over him. It wasn't boiling, but it was hot enough to hurt. He's got red patches all over the top half of his body, on his face and all. Good God! Billy's face registered shock at my open admission. It's a rare temper you've got on you for a bit of a lass. Though you've got guts, I'll give you that much. I was that mad at him for hurting me ma. I didn't think, but it was wrong, and I'm lucky he's no worse. Ma says he might have died if the water had been boiling, and it might have been. Well, as it happens, you've come at a good time, Maggie. My wife Anne is having a baby in a month or so, and she won't be able to do much in the cafe. I need help with making the sandwiches, cooking bacon and serving the customers, but mainly the washing up. Do you think you can do that? I'll be pleased to, sir. I promise I won't let you down, and I wouldn't throw hot water over you. You would regret it if you did. But I need a girl with spirit to stand up to my customers. You'll have to behave yourself, mind. I shall. When can I start, please? You can start tomorrow, and we'll show you what you'll be doing, if you've no objection to working on a Sunday. 
I shook my head vigorously. Right then, lass. We'll see you tomorrow morning bright and early. Thank you so much. You won't regret it. I felt as if I were dancing on air as I ran all the way home, bursting into the kitchen. Some of the pleasure drained out of me as I saw Pa half lying, half sitting on the old sofa that had been brought in from the parlour for his use. What are you looking so happy about? I'll flay the skin off your back when I'm on my feet. You wait and see if I don't. His threat sent shivers down my spine. He was a bully and handy with his fists and his belt, and he wouldn't hesitate to use them on me when he was better. I didn't mean to hurt you the way I did, Pa. I just wanted you to stop hitting Ma. Interfering, little bitch. Keep your nose out in future, and remember, I haven't finished with you yet. You shouldn't hit her like that. She isn't well, and one of these days you could kill her. I faced him stubbornly, unwilling to let his threats frighten me. I'll do for you first. The words contained such hatred, but he'd never liked me. Ma was upstairs, tucking Robin into bed. He was coughing and looked unwell, his cheeks unnaturally high in colour. What's wrong, Robin, love? I sat on the edge of his bed and took his hand in mine. Don't you feel well? I've got a pain in me chest, Maggie, he said, his little face working with distress. Ma says I've got to stay in bed for a day or so, and it's the Sunday school treat tomorrow. We'll see how you are in the morning. Ma ruffled his hair. She turned to me, a mixture of hope and resignation in her eyes. So how did you get on then, lass? I've got a job in a cafe that stays open late at night. I've got to go in in the morning, and Mrs Biggins will show me what to do. The cafe? Well, that's better than a pub. What are they going to pay you? My mouth fell open. I never asked, Ma. Well, there's an idiot. Still... They're bound to give you something, and anything will be a help. She pushed me before her as we left the room, lowering her voice. I think Robin needs the doctor, but I've got no money. You gave me all your wages last night, didn't you? You know I did. I had to pay two weeks on the rent. We needed some coat for the fire. It's been hard going these past years, and now with your pa laid up the way he is. I wish I hadn't done it. I work hard to make it up to you, I promise. And you can have the money I've saved from my coat for Robin. It's a shame, because you needed that coat. But Robin needs the doctor more. I'm not blaming you for it all, Maggie. What happened was your father's fault. If you hadn't been drunk, he wouldn't have hit me, and you wouldn't have thrown that water over him. I don't know what they did to him out there in the trenches, but it must have been pretty bad. He was a good man to me before he went out there. Anne Biggins was a pretty woman, with dark hair and eyes and a friendly smile. She looked me over and nodded her head in approval when we met that morning. It isn't going to be easy for you working here, Maggie, but I'm glad to have you. I'll show you what to do and then we'll see how you go on for a couple of weeks. Does that mean I'll be let go after that? Not if we all get on together. It might be you who wants to leave us at the end of that time. Oh no, I said. I had taken to both Bill and his wife immediately. I don't think I should want to leave you, Mrs Biggins. Well. Let's see how we go on. I've a feeling we shall do very nicely together. It was easy to make the sandwiches, because I'd done them often enough for Robin at home, but it wasn't often I was able to fill his with nourishing cheese and pickles, or the streaky bacon oozing with fat that the working men enjoyed. We have ham sometimes, and beef now and then, Anne told me, but the most popular are the cheese and pickle and the bacon. The other things we get a lot of call for is egg and chips and sausage egg and chips. My stomach rumbled at the thought of all that delicious food, and I wished I could afford to take a bit of it back for Robin. Maybe with some decent food inside him, he wouldn't be so vulnerable to chills and childhood diseases that he brought home from school. Are you hungry, Maggie? Bill asked, making me blush because he must have heard my stomach rumbling. There wasn't much for breakfast this morning. There wouldn't be with your pa off work. Come on then, lass. Show us how good you are cooking bacon, eggs and sausages and then you can eat them. Really? I found it simple enough to cook on the large iron range, because it was just like the one at home, only bigger. Within a short time, there was a plate full of sizzling hot food, which I devoured in minutes, leaving only the sausage, which I surreptitiously removed from the plate and wrapped in a clean handkerchief. Well, if that tasted as good as it looked, I can see the customers coming back for more. Bill's chins wagged as he laughed. I suppose we ought to talk about wages, lass. 
got about five shillings a week to begin with, and another two if we keep you on after the trial period. Oh, and you can cook yourself a meal before you start. He was being extraordinarily generous. I suspected that he had offered more than the going rate because he felt sorry for me. I should be working long hours, but with the promise of five shillings a week and a meal, I couldn't have been happier as I left the cafe and began to walk home. A heavy wagon was rumbling down the cobbled street, pulled by two large black horses. They belonged to the local brewery and had shining brasses on their harness and headbands. As I passed the market, I saw old women selling flowers from wicker baskets and a pearly king and queen was singing for pennies for the poor of the East End. Maybe it wasn't so bad round here after all. At least folk helped each other. Approaching the corner shop, I noticed a board outside with a deep black band all the way round it. The news bulletin said that Queen Alexandra, widow of King Edward VII, had died on the 25th of November. She'd lived for several years after her husband, but now she was gone. A woman stood next to me reading the headlines. She looked at the board and shook her head over the news. That's sad, that is, lass. Still, it comes to us all, Kings or Coleman. Yes, I suppose it does. I'd read in the paper once that Queen Alexandra was a lovely person, always giving things away, and I thought it was a pity that she'd died. What, you Maggie? For a moment or two, I stared at the young man who had spoken, hardly recognising him at first, because he'd shot up and his shoulders had broadened since I'd last seen him. He was dressed in working clothes, but they were clean, and there was something about him that made me look twice. You're Jack Holmes, and you sat two rows behind me in the third year in church school. The teacher had kept him down, because he hadn't been paying attention to the lessons. He was the kind of lad that was always up for a lark, and the others had looked up to him. Yeah, he said, his merry blue eyes going over me. How you doing, Maggie? He had dark wavy hair and a nice mouth. Not so bad. I've just found myself a job at Bill Biggins's calf. I thought you worked down the bakery. I do, but I need a second job in the evenings. Pa had an accident and can't work for a while. I've seen your pa hanging round the docks, but not these past few days. Is there anything I can do to help? I could manage a couple of bob if you're short. No, thanks. I'm getting paid five shillings a week, and that's more than Pa was bringing in when he was working. I reckon he got most of the rough jobs, stuff no one else wanted to do. Your Pa ain't easy, Maggie. A lot of the men don't like him. Sorry, but it's the truth. It's all right. I don't like him much either. Jack was amused. I like you, he said. You're bright and pretty. If you need anything any time, you ask me. Maybe I will, I said, because Jack's grin was infectious. And maybe I won't. You're a tease, Maggie Bailey. Am I? Even if I am, I haven't got time to talk to you. Right, well, I'd best get on, he said. But he didn't look offended. It's the kids' Sunday school treat this afternoon, and I said I'd help out. Will you be bringing Robin, Maggie? If he's well enough. He wasn't too good yesterday, but he says he feels better this morning. I know he won't want to miss the treat. You bring him. Jack took a paper twist filled with sweets from his pocket and offered them to me. They're Fox's glassier mints. Try one. Don't forget what I said about the treat. We're having lots of games and there's a donkey cart for the kids to ride him. Robin would never forgive himself if he missed that, would he? I gave Robin the sausage from the cafe when I found him outside in the backyard. He'd come from the lavatory, which was just a couple of boards over a hole in the ground and emptied by the night soil man. Robin was washing his hands under the tap at the back of the house. To find my brother washing his hands voluntarily was a rare occurrence. Where did you get that? He asked in between bites of the sausage. Does Pa know? It's nothing to do with him. I cooked it at Mr Biggins's cafe and he let me bring it home for you. I thought you worked in the bakery. I'm going to work at the cafe at nights, but I'll be taking you to the Sunday school treat this afternoon. There's a donkey cart and they're having lots of games and things. And the tea. I don't want to miss the Sunday school tea. They'll have cakes and ham sandwiches and jelly. I am better, aren't I, Maggie? Yes, you seem better to me. Come on then, let's help Ma with the chores and then we can get off when we're done. After dinner, I fetched my coat and Robin's wrapping him up warm in his knitted scarf and shabby cap. His eyes were glowing with anticipation, and there were two pink spots in his cheeks. I squashed my doubts about the wisdom of taking him out in the cold wind, knowing that he would be miserable if denied his treat. 
Come on, Maggie, he pulled at my arm. We'll be missing it if we're not quick. Come on, then. I'll be back at half past four, Ma, because I've got to be at the cafe by five. Ma nodded to me. She was carrying the dishes through to the scullery to wash them and hardly noticed a sleeve. It was bitterly cold out, but the sun had poked its way through the grey and that made it feel better. Robin was excited, running ahead of me, down the cobbled street to the church hall, which wasn't much better than a tin shack and had once belonged to a brewery. Robin had a wonderful time at the treat. He was one of the first in line for a ride in the donkey cart and it was Jack Holmes who was in charge of the donkey. He gave Robin an extra turn. It's perks of the job to do a favour for your mates, he said, and winked. Can't say anything wrong with that, can you? I can't, but I think some of the others might. Come on, Robin, there's plenty more to see and do. After the donkey cart, there were games of running, climbing frames and swings, also several stalls where the children could exchange tickets for sticky sweets or small toys, and there was a lucky dip, from which Robin triumphantly pulled a small wooden fire engine, and then, of course, there was the tea with piles of ham or cheese sandwiches, pork pies, sausage rolls, jam tarts, fruit cake, and red jelly. It was just gone half past four when I told Robin we had to leave. The party was still going strong, and he was reluctant. I've got to get to work. I'm sorry, Robin. I promised Ma I would see you safe home, and I'll be late for my first evening at the cafe if I don't go now. Why don't I take Robin home for you? offered Jack, who was standing nearby. I hesitated, because Robin was enjoying himself so much. I didn't know Jack that well, but everyone seemed to like him, and I thought he could be trusted to take care of Robin. Will you make sure he wraps up well before you leave? He catches cold so easily. Don't let him go out without his scarf and cap. I've brothers of me own, and they've got little ones. Jack ruffled Robin's hair. We'll be all right, won't we, young'un? Yeah, we're all right. Please let me stay, Maggie. All right. Behave yourself then, and don't give Jack any trouble. I'll see you in the morning, I nodded to Jack. Thanks for looking after him. No trouble. You get off and don't give us another thought. I'll see him home safe, I promise. The cafe smelled warm as I opened the door. Bill was serving at the counter. He smiled, encouraging me as I went round the back to take off my coat and put on the large apron that swamped me. Get your tea then, lass, Bill said. There's a beef pie tonight if you've a taste for it. Or you can do yourself a fry up if you'd rather. I'd like a slice of the pie and some mash, I said, and helped myself. I took it into the back kitchen to eat it. Anne was standing at the table, ironing a shirt. I wondered if you would come again. Bill could do with some help and I can't stand on my feet like I used to. You'll be a big help to us, Maggie. Thank you, I said, and cleared my plate. I'll take this to the scullery and make a start on the dishes, shall I? You do that, Maggie. When you're finished, you can give Bill a hand out there. I'm tired and I'm off to bed now you're here. I went into the scullery, where the dishes had been piled high. There were some old newspapers to put the scraps in, and I paused to read the top one. There was an article about someone called Josephine Baker. The headline said that she had wowed the crowds in Paris with her witty dancing, and the photograph of her looked indecent because she was wearing hardly anything. I looked at the date. It was October 1925, which was quite recent. Some of the others went back to 1922. Bill must keep his papers a long time. I hoped I would get a chance to read some of them, now that I was working here, but I had no time for reading at the moment. I had to work to earn the meal I'd just eaten. For the first time in years, I didn't have a stomachache because I was hungry. Chapter 3 It was nearly midnight when I crawled into bed on a bitterly cold night towards the end of November. I was sleeping in what had been Sadie's room now. I seemed to get home later and later every evening because there was always another job to do at the cafe and I didn't want to disturb Robin. Falling instantly asleep, I dreamed of Christmas, which was less than a month away. It was the first year that I would be able to buy Robin something good for his Christmas gift. I'd managed a trip to Bermondsey Market and was looking forward to seeing Robin's face when he opened his presents. Because I was so tired, it was a while before I stirred, even though I was being shaken hard. I opened my eyes sleepily, looking at Ma in bewilderment. Is it time to get up? It's five o'clock. I would have let you sleep for another hour, but Robin is ill. He's been coughing half the night, keeping your father awake. He kept me fetching and carrying for him for ages, but he's gone off at last, and I don't want Robin to wake him. 
You'll have to see to your brother. Make him a warm drink and see if he'll settle. If not, we may have to fetch the doctor, and it's foggy out. I jumped out of bed and pulled on the dress I'd worn for work the previous evening. I could hear Robin whimpering in the next room and hurried to his side. What's wrong, love? I asked. As I placed a hand on his forehead, he was burning up. I feel bad, Robin said tearfully. Me head aches and me throat is sore. I don't like it when you're not here, Maggie. He always wanted me there. Even though at almost eight years of age, he was old enough to sleep alone. I didn't want to wake you when I came in, love. He felt hot and damp to the touch. I'll make you a warm drink. That will ease your throat, darling. This wasn't the first time he'd suffered with a nasty chill this winter, but he seemed poorly. I didn't want anything to happen to Robin. He was far too precious. However, when I gave him the warm milky drink, he swallowed it all and appeared easier, drifting off to sleep. There was no point in going back to bed, even though it was early. I might as well dress properly and then make breakfast for Ma and me before I got off to work. If anything, the fog was worse when I left the bakery and walked to the cafe, the pavements really icy now and treacherous underfoot. The Barrow boys were already packing up their goods, laughing and calling to one another cheerfully despite the chill. The windows of the cafe were steamed up and running with water as I went in, but it was comforting inside, because Bill had the big round-bellied stove burning. Oh, it's lovely in here. Got to keep the customers happy. I think some of them only come in nights to get warm. Some of our customers were vagrants who had no homes to go to and lived on the few pence they could earn doing odd jobs on the waterfront. They stayed to the very last minute because it was warm and comfortable in the cafe and most of them would sleep under the bridges at night. Bill knew them all by name and what had brought them down to this level. There was old Tom, as he was known, his greasy grey locks hanging about a face lined with sorrow. He'd lost his home and all his family in the war and had lived on the streets ever since his mind wandering at times. I liked him and was glad when Bill told me to give him an extra cup of tea with his meal because he seemed so sad and lonely. Some of the others were surly devils and I didn't enjoy serving them, but none of them ever bothered me, perhaps because they knew that Bill would bar them from the cafe if they did. I wasn't sure you would come tonight, lass. It's a terrible night, not fit to send a dog out. It's a wonder your ma didn't make you stay at home. I thought you might need me. I couldn't tell him that Ma couldn't afford for me to have even one night off. Ma kept Robin home this morning because of his chest. Got a cough, has he? I've got something that might help. Let's hope you don't take ill, coming out on a night like this. The terrible weather made little difference to our trade. If anything, the customers stayed longer, preferring to sit in the corner near Bill's stove and drink tea rather than venture outside into the freezing night. I'd hoped it might clear when I was ready to leave, but if anything, the fog was worse. I can't see across the street, Bill said when he looked out. I don't think you should walk home in this, lass. You can sleep on the sofa in the parlour if you like. Ma might worry if I didn't get home, but if she were asleep, she might not even know I hadn't returned, and it was a terrible night. Are you sure? I asked, tempted to stay in the warm. Wouldn't say if I wasn't. Anne will give you a blanket and a pillow. It's best if you stay, Maggie, in weather like this. I'll stay then. I'll help out until the last minute and then go through. But if it lifts, I'll be off early in the morning so as not to worry Ma. I finished the washing up before going through to the parlour. Bill had spoken to his wife and she had brought out a pillow and two blankets. She made a wry face as she put her hand to her back. I've been feeling a bit off all day. I've got another month to go. But if I get much bigger, I'll never make it. I keep thinking I've got me dates wrong and the baby would take us by surprise. I should think that would be a relief. You've been suffering a lot recently. Bill came through to join us. I hadn't the heart to throw old Tom out, he said. I've let him sleep in there by the stove, Anne. I'll see he goes first thing in the morning, whatever the weather. You're too soft your own good, Bill Biggins. You keep the door to the cafe shut, Maggie. I don't think Tom's the sort to sleepwalk, but you never know. He wouldn't hurt a fly, and he likes Maggie. He gave Anne a look that took in her weariness. It's up to bed for you, love. You look worn out. Good night, Maggie. I wished them good night and then sat down on the sofa after they had gone. After looking about me so that I would know where I was if disturbed in the night, I lay down and was soon asleep. 
I slept soundly for some hours, waking suddenly when I heard a noise close by, and the light came on. I blinked as I saw Bill in his nightclothes, a thick dressing gown over his nightshirt. Sorry to wake you, Maggie, but I think Anna's started the baby. I need to go for the doctor. Will you go up and sit with her until I get back? Yes, of course. Has the fog cleared? Bill looked out of the window. He was pulling on a heavy overcoat. It looks a bit better, though it's still a rough night. I'll be back as soon as I can. I heard him speaking to old Tom as he went through the cafe, but then a scream from upstairs made me bolt up them. There were two bedrooms, but it was easy enough to find Anne's because the light was on and she was making a terrible howling noise. She was sitting up, bolstered by a pile of feather pillows against the brass and iron bedstead. I went straight to her, taking her hand and holding it as she panted, her teeth bared. Is there anything I can do to help? I'm sorry, but I've never been round a woman giving birth before. I've no idea what you need. We shall need a lot of hot water, lass. The voice made me swivel round in surprise. Bill couldn't be back that soon. I gasped as I saw it was the man I thought of as old Tom, but looking very different to the way he usually did. He had put off his filthy and torn coat and rolled his sleeves up to his elbows. I had time to register that his shirt looked surprisingly clean before he spoke again. Don't look so surprised, lass. Didn't Bill tell you I used to be a doctor? If he'd told what was wrong, he needn't have gone out on such a filthy night. I've brought more babes into this world than a few. Get off and put some pans of water on to heat. No! Anne was looking at him in fright. Don't leave me, Maggie. I don't want him near me. It's all right, Mrs. Biggins, Tom said in a soft, persuasive voice. I really do know what I'm doing. I've scrubbed my hands in the sink downstairs, and by the looks of things, you can't wait for the doctor your man's gone to fetch. Bill might have known that Tom had once been a doctor, but he hadn't trusted him to look after his wife, and nor did she. I suppose they both thought he was past it. I looked at Anne and saw what he'd already seen. The child's head was visible between its mother's thighs and a mass of black hair. Throwing Anne an apologetic look, I headed for the stairs. Anne was screaming like a banshee again when I carried the steaming kettle and a bowl upstairs a little later. I was just in time to see Tom bringing the baby out. He turned with a grin on his face as I entered, showing me the little wriggling body covered in its mother's blood and then laid it in Anne's arms. A short time later, Tom dealt efficiently with the afterbirth, turning to me at last with a nod of satisfaction. You'll need to bathe the child in a minute. When they've got to know each other a bit, he said, I'll leave you to finish up here. I think you can make them both comfortable now. I've done all that needs doing for Mrs. Biggins, except clean her up, and I think she would rather you did that, Maggie. He clearly knew that she'd accepted his help only because she had no choice. Thank you, and called to his departing back. I'm sorry for what I said at the start. Tom shook his head, but didn't look round as he went out.